Hello. All right. Just looking around here, I think I've got everything figured out as much as I need to. Can you guys hear me? All right. I am planning to share my screen, John, for at least part of the thing. So that's, I think I can. Assume that works, right? All right, good. I I was in here for a minute, tried to do that, and had, this is a new uh, MacBook, so it did not set up to allow sharing of um, from Google Chrome. So I had to set that up and then exit and then come back in. But I think, yeah, I think I'm good now. All right, so it's 9.01. We've, I'm assuming, you know, 9, 9 a.m. on a Sunday um, to talk about grammar. You know, I'm sure more people will come flooding in at some point, but I think that uh, I'll get started, if that's fine with everybody. So, it's time to, I'm just making sure I got, hey, hey, Sally, how are you doing? I'm just making sure that I sort of understand the navigation here, and I think I do. It's pretty straightforward. So, um, I was just getting ready to start, and, you know, I, I, met, I said a couple minutes ago, you know, I'm sure this is what everybody wants to do on a Sunday morning at 9 a.m., talk about grammar. So, as the people come flooding in, we'll just accommodate that as we go along. Um, I did want to say to everybody that I didn't realize, um, I, sh I kind of should have, obviously, because this was all planned and we had the schedule in advance, but I wasn't thinking about the fact that uh, we are on vacation right now at Bethany Beach. So I'm in a small um, area with a four-year-old, a six-year-old, and a nine-year-old. Right now, two of those three are sleeping, but at some points during the presentation this morning, you may hear noise, which would be my co-teachers uh, helping me out or uh, disrupting me, however you want to look at it. So I just wanted to say that to get started, and also a little orientation to the to the module, I called it um, Me Write Good and So Can't You. And um, basically, we're going to talk a little bit today about grammar and style and how those two things are connected. And, uh, you know, some we'll do some some examples 
and talk more broadly about these ideas around grammar and style. So I think we'll get started relatively quickly. Sally, thanks. Uh, we just bought this, you know, so I just bought this t-shirt last month for Pride Month, and it's uh, also very comfortable. So double, you know, it's always good when both of those things work out. So um, for now, I'm going to share my screen and talk a little bit and then um, come back occasionally to look at the chat and see what's going on there. But a lot of the interactive activities we'll be doing, um, you'll be doing hopefully along with me and uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, this is also a brand new module. So just so everybody knows, um, you are my guinea pigs for it. So I appreciate that, but also apologize in advance. Um, if it doesn't quite cohere yet, we're trying to, you know, I'm trying to figure out what we're talking about and how the best way to talk about it is. So let me share my presentation here and then we will um, go from there. All right, so I have this in Google. In the Google Drive, you can see down here this um, URL.com slash Duval, IYWM 2021. That link will take you to the presentation if you want to. There are some links in the presentation that I'll be asking you guys to click, but I will also be sharing those in the chat for the people who are live. If you're watching this on a recording, you should be able to still use both the link to the presentation and the links within the presentation itself. So we'll see. So. Oh, I can see myself and the screen. All right. I, for some reason, I thought I could. But I'm going to have you guys think about a poll here. And I'm going to actually make this in the in the event here if I, if I can we'll we'll see how this goes Just one second here. I am having a problem with select. There we go. All right. So now we've got a poll going under over by the chat under the polls area. And you should be able to vote there. deselect here so that that is so I'm not influencing anybody's decision but basically we're, we're talking about grammar slash style and the two options here are that anybody who wants to be a professional writer should know and enforce the rules of grammar or so-called rules about writing are just social constructs and professional writers don't need to worry about knowing them I kind of cut off the end of that there but you get the idea. All right, so when we think about this idea that there's these rules and we need to strictly enforce them, or maybe there are no rules and we can just do whatever we want because we are writers. Um, obviously, that's sort of a false choice, right, between the two, because some combination of those two things is right. Okay, so I have a couple of examples here that I wanted to mention 
Um, at one point in early, earlier in my marriage, my wife told me she was nauseous or nauseous. And I said, you never want to say that because nauseous means making somebody nauseated. It doesn't mean that you are nauseated. And we argued back and forth. We looked it up and it turns out that technically speaking, the word nauseous does mean you make people nauseated, but it's become used to mean you are nauseated, you are sick so much that that is now an acceptable use of it. Um, at another point, and not to make uh, myself sound like a jerk, but this was a conversation. My wife and I were having a conversation about spending. And she said, I said she was uh, spending too much of our money. And she said, I'm not some kind of spendthrift. And I said, what do you mean spendthrift? Like, I'm saying you're spending too much money, not that you're saving money. And she said, you don't know what spendthrift means. So we looked it up and it turns out that I did not know what spendthrift mean, meant because I thought the thrift part meant that you're careful about not spending money, but it actually means to spend money like wildly and extravagantly. All right. So there's two examples. In one case, I was technically right. The other case, I was technically wrong. And in neither case, was it a productive discussion or argument? So you know, those are some examples of where we can get sometimes tied up in those rules about grammar, word meaning, um, things like that, and sort of miss, I guess, the forest for the trees. The other extreme of that, though, is this idea of what am I even talking about that I have there? So sometimes um, I've seen it a few times in writing, but I see it much more on social media things like um, you know Facebook obviously and other areas where people's use of the language becomes you know so unstructured that you can't even understand what the point they're trying to make is or or make any meaning out of what's there on the page so you know this idea that there are no rules that we need to follow we don't need to be aware of rules um, none of it matters is also not true right both of these things are are equally important. So here we have sort of my argument for today that I'm going to hopefully have you guys help help me um, think about, which is uh, that there are rules that govern writing. But at the same time, our language is dynamic. So those rules can change over time by the way people use the language. So there's an issue with prescriptivism where a lot of times it just becomes a way to show that you're smarter than other people or to keep uh, people on the you know outside, people below you from attaining sort of your status. On the other hand, a careful attention to those rules kind of respects the people who have worked with language before us, as well as the people who are reading our writing. So, I think it's important that we do know the rules and that we follow them uh, most of the time. But if you're ever not sure, like you're not specifically trying to break a rule, you're not sure if there even is a rule that you're breaking or you're having some kind of problem, I think the best option is the opinion of other experts. So if we think about this, um, you know, every year there's a list that comes out of words that were added to the dictionary. Uh, that year and people flip out because that's not a word or that's not a phrase or, you know, Google can't be a verb or whatever the, the case may be. But the way they come up with those lists is they just ask a bunch of people who are experts in grammar, is this word okay in this usage? Is it okay to say, uh, to use Google as a verb? And if they ask experts and 55 of them say yes, they might add it to the dictionary. If they ask those 100 experts and only 10 of them say yes, that's okay, they won't add it to the dictionary. So there is kind of this um, rule by committee that happens as well. And as we go along, I wanted to give uh, a shout out to this book by Steven Pinker called The Sense of Style. 
The Thinking Person's Guide to Writing in the 21st Century. I came out about six years ago. Actually, the paperback version came out about six years ago. So there may have been a hardcover before that. But it's, I think, relevant still. And also one of the best sort of style guide books that I've read because it talks about a lot of these ideas and it sort of formulates them and expresses them in a much better way probably than I will today. So that's where my apology comes in. You know, any ideas that I borrowed from him that I sort of butcher here, I apologize for, but it's definitely a good book and one that is worth adding to your bookshelf. All right. So now we have our first interactive activity, the adjective order activity. If you're here and you want to try this out, you can click on that link that I just pasted in the chat. And you should be able just to type in your name. You, you don't have to use your real name. You can even make up a name. And I won't tell people if it's inappropriate or not. And then uh, answer the question there. If you just want to listen along or look along, basically the question that you're going to see when you go to that um, quiz is this one. Is this sentence correct or incorrect? And if it's incorrect, how would you fix it? And you can just add a text box if you're in the Class Kick app to type your answer, or you can just think about it. And if you want to, type your answer in the chat here. Good morning, Kenya. going to take a minute here to let people sort of look at that or think about it. All right, and we've got some answers coming in here in the chat, as well as, um, let me just stop sharing that screen for a minute and I'll show you. Um, some of the responses here. So basically, I've given you all uh, aliases so we've got the beaming bookworm who said it's incorrect. We've got the bold bear who said it's incorrect. All right, so if you, he loved his big old brown leather bag is how bold bear would rewrite this, all right? So good, and it is wordy. This is more of a, um, a way to start thinking about this idea of adjective order. All right, let me stop sharing that. And then let's look at, um, so Danielle said um, he left his big old brown leather bag, right? And I think that's right. Um, he left his big old brown leather bag. That sounds right to me. 
And so let me share this um, screen again. And Danielle also asked if it has to do with culture, which is an interesting thing, and we will bring that up too, right? So basically, yeah. This, what I wanted to point out with this activity was, first of all, um, I, I got this from an article, and this was a couple of years ago. I went back and tried to find the article so I could share it with you guys, and I can't find it. But if you look it up, like this is a common sort of thing. There actually is a rule in the syntax of the English language that says what order adjectives should be in. So when we see um, that original, as native English speakers, we know that that's not right. And for me, I was never taught this in school, like ever. I encountered it, like I said, about you know three or four years ago. And it sort of blew my mind that you can look at this and see that, you know, just by rearranging it, you can kind of see what those rules are. If you look them up there, there are defined rules. So it has to be, you know, size first, then age, then color, then type. All right. And we've never heard of it. The other thing about it is that um, if you are not a native English speaker, you won't notice that this is an error because that adjective order thing is sort of ingrained in the language. Um, and, you know, it becomes much I shouldn't say you won't notice it, but it will be much harder to notice that it, that those are things are out of order or an error. So what that means to me is when we talk about these prescriptive rules of grammar, there are definitely rules that underlie some of the things we do, some of the things we write and say. Um, and we can assign those, but there's things that we sort of do automatically that we don't we're not even aware of. Right. So that goes back to that idea of these are sort of social constructs. Some of it is actually related to um, related to like the cognitive load and things you can process and all these things. Um, and so part of writing is just listening to the words, looking at how they sound and getting feedback from people about whether it works or not for them. Okay. So now we're going to continue with another activity. And this one is more along the lines of what we think about when we think about grammar, or at least what I think about when I think about grammar. So I've got um, this grammar fix activity. And there's a link if you want to look at it um, in the class kick app and do it there. You can also just look here on the slides. Basically, um, this is simply rewrite the sentence so that it's grammatically correct. And uh, some of them, you may say, already are grammatically correct, in which case you can just say correct and keep going, or don't change it and keep going. But I'm going to look at some of your responses, so you can share them, like I said, in class kick. I can see them there. Or you can share them here in the chat um, to look at some of these, because there are at least a few that may not be, strictly speaking, incorrect, uh, from the rules, but are definitely unclear or could be rewarded. So you can also just do um, that kind of stuff with them, too. So there's 10 examples here. I'm going to wait, you know, three or four minutes for people to work on this. And then we'll start going through these sort of one by one.
All right. Yeah. Danny also their computer isn't allowing the app to work, which, you know, is something obviously, as I said at the beginning, um, I'm just trialing this out to see sort of how things go. So this is my first run through. Um, and I was afraid that that might happen, which is why I added the exercises here as well. And hopefully, yeah, that lets you still participate, even if that app doesn't completely load for you. Um, but I do apologize, you know, that you guys are my guinea pigs, although I appreciate it. It helps me hopefully to make this into a more usable module that I can you know, perhaps reuse at some point in the future. So what I'm going to do here, um, I'm actually going to share my other screen. Let's see how this goes. All right. So I'm going to start going through these. And of course, if you're still working through them, um, feel free to chime in on the chat or to just continue working and ignore me talking or whatever you want to do. Um, but let's, let's look at some of these. So this, this first one, for some reason, I think, uh, you know, I've been having some issues with my, with my leg. And so I think this ad showed up for this hip hook um, tool. That's some kind of exercise tool. And it says, you know, once positioned, the hip hook works with your own body weight while either stand against the wall or lay flat on the floor to push into your psoas and iliacus muscles, which connect to the hip flexor muscles and will immediately release tension and reduce pain, explains Bernard. So it's like a one of those written ads for this thing. And Danielle pointed out, right, that this is a common issue where we confuse lie versus lay. So it should actually be lie flat on the floor. Now, somebody else had mentioned when they were looking at this that it's also you know, pretty hard to understand, right? There's a lot of technical words in here, uh, description of those muscles, and you can kind of get the idea maybe of what they're saying, but you're not quite sure. So there's also a style issue besides that grammar error, right? But the grammar error I was looking at here was lie versus lay. Now, the next one, I want to make red beet eggs like my grandmother. So that I saw this, um, somebody had posted this online and, you know, it's one of those things where some people said technically correct, which is, which it is, it's correct. It's possibly confusing because you could look at it and think that red beet eggs don't like this person's grandmother. And so we're trying to figure out ways to make them you know, more compassionate to, towards their grandmother. Or you might think that this person's grandmother was a red beet egg, which would also be odd if that happened, right? But generally, we I think most of us understand she's trying to say her grandmother made good red beet eggs, and she would also like to do that. If you don't know what red beet eggs are, I don't know if that's a Pennsylvania Dutch or thing or not, or just, uh, you know, something that's broadly out there but basically you take beets boil them and then you put hard boiled eggs in with the the beets and the juice and i think you add like vinegar and sugar or something and the eggs absorb the beet juice and then you can eat them so that's what she's talking about she's trying to make a good recipe like her grandmother um so this one would be one that you could just leave if you think most people will understand it, or you could change it to say, I want to make red beet eggs the way my grandmother used to, or the way my grandmother does, that would make it perfectly clear what you're saying, right? So um, not a hard and fast rule there, just some ideas of how you could perhaps communicate better with that. Now this next one, the job of a family therapist is to understand the family culture of which the larger culture with its many layered meanings is a part. All right, so um, what do we think about this one?
I think again, like this one is confusing part partially, like that that modifier with as many layered meanings. If that's talking about the larger culture, the family culture. So again, this is an example of how you can sometimes have things that are technically correct but are confusing still. And also sometimes you have things that are completely incorrect but still make complete sense. Um, let me look at what some other people thought about this one. So split infinitive, right? Let's see if anybody else wrote anything or is just looking at it. Some people I think are just looking at these, which is good. All right, so yeah. So here's one. Believe me, I know grammar. I have a MFA in creative writing. So this is one of those indefinite article things, a versus an. And in this case, it should be an. I have an MFA because the rule is that if the if it starts with a um, vowel sound, it's an, even if it's not technically a vowel. Is that what I mean? I think so. It's too early in the morning to think about vowels versus consonants. All right, but. Basically, we should say I have an MFA in creative writing because it starts with the E sound, all right? If we said I have a master of fine arts degree, you would say A. And then what about this one? Tables are for eating customers only. Right. This is another one of those things where um, you probably get the idea of what they're trying to communicate. Uh, but you could also read this as right, some some serious cannibalism going on. So what do you think? How would you reword this one um, so that it would be both, you know, more stylistically precise as far as what what you're trying to say? That would be in a book I would write. I think I might have written a book like that. So this one is actually because that only comes at the end, right? So you could change it, right? Tables are for dining customers only. Tables are only for dine-in customers. Would make it more clear, right? So there's a, I think the other thing that I wanted to point out here is that even when we agree that there's an error, um, there are sometimes more than one way to fix that error, right? So a, a number of ways that we could make this better and, and <laughs> there you go. Tables are only for preparing and eating customers. Makes it more clear that you know what you're trying to limit there. All right, so let's look at the next one here. All right, so this was also one I came across in some writing. You and I both. Where does the time go? What do we think, correct or incorrect? So Don suggests it should be you and me both.
right? <laughs> because she's a grammar a-hole, right? So it's like, this is the um, subject versus subjective versus objective pronoun for the first person, right? If you want to get technical. So um, if you said, you and I both are confused, right? You wouldn't say, I are confused. You'd say, me am confused, something like that, right? But it's that rule. You and me both, where does the time go? And then let's look at the next one because this is another example of the same thing. This is from actually the book, um, The Midnight Library. If you haven't read it, I just finished reading that. It's a pretty good book, but she's, she says, have me and Ash been to Barcelona together, Plato? And in this case, it's the opposite, right? It should be I, have I been to Barcelona, right? But it's the same um, grammar issue. It's that that subject versus object, right? And obviously, my guess is that that uh, I can't remember the name of the author of the Midnight Library, but the author probably knows this rule. If not, I'm sure the editors at that place know the rule. But it's uh, well, Donna. That's part of the plot of the book about why why uh, the the narrator doesn't remember if, if they've been there or not. Um, it's a pretty interesting book. I felt like it started out more promising than it ended up, but I still enjoyed it as a read. Um, and, I, you know, I noticed, too, that uh, Stephen King's most recent release, I think it's his most recent, he writes so much it's hard to tell, but the, the book later, he also has some instances of this where because he's trying to write it as a first person narrator who is a kid who's not a professional writer, he sometimes does this. But to me, it was confusing um, in the Stephen King book because I know that Stephen King, who's a 70 year old prolific writer who definitely knows this rule and was deliberately breaking it. So sometimes that option can be kind of weird, too. So, yeah, if you if you were going to rewrite this, um, to be grammatically correct, you would write, have Ash and I been to Barcelona together, Plato, and that would sound better. But the point here is that, um, you know, professional writers and editors reviewed this and decided this was okay, because probably because it's somebody actually talking and in, in person, we w might say this. Um, you know, this is also what they call a hypercorrection, where people try to be so precise, grammatically correct, that they end up overcorrecting and doing something wrong um, that they don't didn't mean to do. And so the other point I wanted to make, you know, Donna I jokingly maybe said um, she was a grammar a-hole. And, and, you know, I, I alluded to this earlier that sometimes this idea of, um, of being precise and, and requiring this precision is a way to sort of, you know, elevate ourselves because now we know something that this person didn't know. It's especially popular in online discussions, if you want to call them that, or arguments, um, where it's a way to sort of demean somebody's argument because they don't even know basic grammar or whatever. But, you know, if somebody says to me, um, I don't know, my mother and me just attended my grandmother's funeral, and I go, well, that's unfortunate because it's my mother and I. You know what I mean? Like, that may not be the time to make that correction. And sometimes it, it is not that big of a deal if we can understand what the person's saying and doing. But at the same time, if you you know have a piece of writing that you're workshopping and everybody is is having an issue with with some sentence or some phrasing, then it might be time to consider that you could rephrase it just to avoid that confusion for the readers. All right, let's look at this one. Who should I make the checkout to? So in this case, we're continuing on with that theme about, you know, precision. I would say also somewhat audience and level of formality that you're that you're writing about. Because Susan's right, it should be technically, if we want to get snobby and not end on a preposition, it should be to whom should I make out the check, right? And so Donna points out that like. If you walk, if you walk into the grocery store,
paying by check, first of all, everybody hates you because nobody pays by check anymore. But second of all, if you say, to whom should I make out the check, people are just going to look at you and like, oh, you know, where's your, where's your tuxedo, Mr. Formal? You know what I mean? So there is some idea of audience. And also, um, I believe this is one of the rules in, in the book I mentioned earlier, the style book, um, that technically there's nothing in the syntax of English that says you can't end on a preposition. Like it's rooted in some rule from Latin, which, you know, is not around anymore, all of those sorts of things. So again, I would say, you know, you want to look at formality of, of the writing or the speaker. I mean, if some, if a character in a book says to whom should I make out the check, like that tells you something about the character. I don't know if it's uh, good or bad, but definitely something. All right, and the last one, the anchor looked grim. So this is talking about a news report, all right? The anchor looked grim. I felt grim, but I also found it hard to look away. What do we think? Do we think that's correct or incorrect? <laughs> I tried to find somewhere they talked about grimacing, but I like that's I think um, that's been mostly eradicated from the English language due to this crusade. So what I why I included this one is it's one of those it's an example that um is actually technically correct and i think it's also fine like i think it makes sense especially if i included the the whole quote um or the whole paragraph that it's in like it's fine and it's from a, a news article i think that was in the atlantic um i included it because what some people will say is that you can't start a sentence with that coordinator but right like i think at the grade school level they still will sometimes teach that you can't start a sentence with and or but and then later on they have to say oh actually you can right so it's one of those things where sometimes we we hear about rules um and they're more like writing or grammar urban legends or whatever, however you want to think about that. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those things to consider sometimes whether something really is a rule or not. And of course, to us, I think, at least to me, this stuff is interesting and it matters, but it's also one of those things where um, does it matter, like, for instance, if you know the technical terms for all these things, like, um, you know, Split in, if you know what a split infinitive is or a dangling modifier or any of those sorts of things, um, does it matter that you know what they are, like the technical terminology? And I would say sometimes, right, it, depending on who you're talking to, that can become an indicator of your level of seriousness about what you're doing and about your craft. And then along with that, I would say, though, that sometimes just being able to look at that and know that there's something wrong and fix it is enough. And sometimes it might also be that you're the only person worrying about it, um, how that how that goes. Yeah, I, I'm trying not to um, break, you know, I'm trying not to break anybody mentally here with too many of this, too much of this stuff, but yeah, some of these things are interesting to consider. And I guess I said that was the last one. Actually, this is the last one, which um, does have one of those <laughs> one of those danglers, which is you know a fun word to, to say, and and in this case, very appropriate. Um, when presented with the potion, not one drop was drunk. Right, and we're missing some something here about who's not doing the drinking right so it's, it's unclear so we would 
probably rewrite this, like when presented with the potion. Um, right, and Donna's right. Like this ends up then being passive voice so that we don't know who was doing the drinking and we don't know who was presented with the potion. So, you know, when presented with the potion, we did not drink it. That would be okay. Still not great. I might, you know, rework the whole thing, but yeah. So, you know, sometimes in this case, just to know that there's an issue and fix it might be enough. To know what the rule is and why it's an issue would be better. But also, you know, sometimes when we're giving feedback to other people, we might what we might. Um, I like that, Timmons. Not one drop drop was inebriated. There you go. Um, I think sometimes, you know, like I know early on in in my um, teaching career, I was teaching composition classes at a community college. Um, actually, Westmoreland Community College near Greensburg, and sometimes I would rely on, you know, using the the formal definition of the rule to sort of make make it make myself more secure in the fact that I was an expert. But I'm not sure how much that helped um, the writers I was working with when I would say, you know, avoid dangling modifiers, and they have no idea what I mean. Like I think. If you can say that as well as give an example and explain sort of why, that always um, becomes better, right? Uh, and in this case, <laughs> Danielle's right. Like when presented with the potion, I drank the whole thing is more is more likely to be the case um, with the in your right mind group. Uh, so yeah. All right, I'm going to stop sharing that one. Let's go back to my uh, presentation here. All right, so, you know, as we were talking about that, we talked a little bit about grammar and syntax, and we actually did get somewhat into style. You know, we're talking about passive voice and some of those things, but, you know, one of the things that um, Pinker pre talks about in his style writing book, and a lot of people talk about it in terms of style, is that even sometimes with 100% perfect grammar, syntax, uh, you know, all those things, you can still have a style that's poor. It's not great. Um, yesterday in Mike Arnzen's module, he was talking about, you know, somebody writes something like, yeah, the man walks into the room. The room is blue. The man sits in a chair. The man is happy. Or, you know, all of those sentences together are grammatically correct, syntactically correct, but the style isn't great. Like, it, it feels almost amateurish how it's written, right? Along with that, we mentioned earlier that the audience matters. So sometimes, you know, a more formal um, style is appropriate. Sometimes, you know, an informal style and breaking some of these rules is appropriate. Um, so, give me one second. All right, we got we got some avid YouTubers here. Um, so what I wanted to, to talk about and think about just a little bit, um, the last section here is style. Um, now, I will say, I'm going to type, uh, put this here. And I'm actually going to pull this up then in the, in the class kick app so you can look at one of the sample passages. I don't think we'll have time for both of them. I'm going to add that these are both samples of my writing from drafts. And so I wanted to do that because I don't feel I don't like uh, picking on other writers too much. And also I could use the help with this dial in, in a couple of these. Um, so I might. If I if I borrow your um, 
any of your feedback, I will list you as a co-author or uh, uh, yeah, co-author on the on the result. But let me pull up one of those in. Uh, let's look at this one. I'm going to switch my screen sharing here again. So I'm actually going to look at the second one here. This is just a couple paragraphs. This was a draft of actually my... Um, thesis novel for, uh, yeah, my thesis novel for the MFA program um, way back in 2011. So what would you say here? Like, what, what are some things that could be done to improve the style? Because the other thing that I was going to say, I think, about writing is you never, like, you're done at a certain point when it gets published and it's in other people's hands, but, like, you're never really done. Uh, there's always something that could be better, that could be improved. So while you think about that and maybe reflect on it, um, this so in this novel, the protagonist here, the she is Candy, and her she she was a professional wrestler, so she's talking to her um, boyfriend at the time, who is Dale. All right, so Susan says it could be. Like there's some sort of head hopping back and forth, right? Between what's going on. Um, so have people, have actions of different people in their own paragraphs, right? Which could make sense. I like that. I mean, there are a few. I don't know. Some of this is a little over the top. You know, the animal lust glazing her eyes. And also, um, just the term animal lust is a little. Yeah, that, that animal lust. That, I don't know. That, that seems a little weird. Um knife to pry the ribbon off so that's a good point danielle it should actually probably be to pry off the ribbon that might work yeah that i agree with you donna that as i'm reading it now you know with some distance from it that animal lust thing just seems odd and also over the top although you know it's a book about pro wrestling so over the top is sort of built in but still that, that might be a little a little too much Yeah, and that's another example, right, where we're – it's not quite clear the whose point of view we're in there or who's observing this. So there might be too much going on there, like it's trying to do too much. All right. So, I mean, it's good. Yeah, and see, in this case, I think it was supposed to be saying that, like, he was attractive, but it's, it's making you think that, um, like, that 
women found him attractive, I think is is making you think that he is finding them attractive or or something, right? So it's uh, so yeah. I mean, that's just an example, right? That some of those things are definitely grammar issues, like the pry off the ribbon versus pry the ribbon off. That's a that's a grammar sort of issue. Some of these issues are more broadly style, right? Um, so let's do, you know, we got five minutes left, so I want to do a little wrap up here. And hopefully tie some ideas together. So one thing I wanted to make sure that I said that I've thought about a lot and is really super nerdy. And, and so I felt like this was one of the few areas where the few places I should say where I can share this and have people at least somewhat identify with it, even if they think it's kind of weird and hokey is just the fact of, you know, writing as an act is completely awesome. Right. You, have, you know, 26 letters, some punctuation marks, and all those things are basically pictures. We arrange them in a certain order. We have these limited number of pictures we can use, but we can use them to make an unlimited number of words and sentences and ideas. And then we can, if we do it well, with those pictures, we can communicate to other humans across space and time and put ideas right into their heads so that they see things that we are imagining, right? It's when you think about it, it's almost uh, mind blowing. And so, that's why these issues of, you know, knowing the rules, following the rules become important. You know, that, that idea of copy editing and worrying about style shows respect for other people who are writers, as well as for the people who are going to read your stuff. Hopefully the point, you know, I, I know we sort of ran out of a little time to look at some of those issues of style at the end, but, you know, style is more than simply that copy editing, the grammar fixing. Um, and so in my mind, at least, it makes it harder to do. You know, it's pretty easy to do some of the mechanical stuff and to identify that. But if you start talking about style and organization and, you know, word choices and things like that, that becomes harder. So point there is like if you do editing services for somebody, you might want to specify what kind of editing you're doing and also consider that in terms of, you know, time and how you're going to how you're going to uh, be reimbursed for that. So, and then finally, I want to talk about where can you go, like, if you have questions. So, obviously, books, you know, I mentioned um, the Thinking Person's Guide to Style earlier. There's a ton of books, you know, On Writing by Stephen King is one of my favorite books. Zen and the Art of Writing, while not, um, you know, heavy on some of these rules, is also very good by Ray Bradbury. I included a link to this Grammar Girl um, blog slash website that I sometimes find information on um, Grammarly is an app that you'll that I get a ton of ads for I occasionally have looked at like some of their free their free stuff and it seems pretty decent and I've read that their paid stuff is pretty good um, but one thing that's interesting about that is like it uses artificial intelligence computers to basically give you some of this feedback which tells you that there's rules built in right if a computer can if you can train a computer to do it, there's rules that are there, but there's also some things that computers have a hard time figuring out. So like a computer can tell you what songs were written by Bob Dylan because it can go look those up and it can also examine the structure of a song and say, this looks like songs that Bob Dylan likes. But um, at the same time, the computer can't tell you like that some of Bob Dylan's songs are, are about war and how war isn't a good thing. You know, there's some things that computers, um, they've tried to figure out how to get computers to make like social networks of books, like which characters are talking and interacting which, with which other characters and computers have a hard time figuring out pro references when the, whatever it's referencing isn't right before it. So there's, there's stuff like that. And, and Tasha said she likes Grammarly as a, as a resource or a potential resource, but there's sometimes issues with it. So I would say that's probably true of that Grammarly and of other things too. I didn't want to give you guys a chance to share where we're at time, but um, any other favorites that you have that you would want to share? Any 
And while you're thinking about that and possibly typing, um, I should add most of these things, like if you have a question about, um, you know, I versus me or, or any of those, if you just Google it, you'll find tons of resources on the web. You just have to figure out which ones are, are decent and worth doing. So, all right. So that's all I have, Donna. Thank you for um, all your work in organizing this. And um, it's been a great, I think it's been a great way to still stay connected to the community. Um, and that's the, the one that I skipped over there in places to go for help was the writer groups. Um, and so, you know, we talked about language by committee. We have a, a resource around us of other fellow writers who are great and have expertise often where we don't, and we might have some expertise where they don't. So that's always a good way to get help too. So that's all I have for today, everybody. Thanks for coming, and I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great conference.